Good morning and welcome. Thank you for being a part of your Paulding County government this morning. This time I will call the Paulding County Board of Commissioners work session for April the 24th in order. And I'd ask Brian to go bring the sheet forward, please, and turn on your, your loud devices. We are very honored and privileged to have Dean Morehouse, Pastor Morehouse, come forward uh, from Westside Christian Church to lead us in our invocation and replace the flag. Stay in the prayer. Let's go to our Lord in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, as I've been driving around the county seeing all these little signs pop up, basically saying, vote for me. The landscape is scattered with them. May they be people of integrity. May they look to you for leadership and guidance. And in their desire to serve and to be servants to the people, may we also, as citizens of this county, remember we have a responsibility of getting to know them and making sure that they lead in a way that is pleasing to you. We thank you for those commissioners who have been serving. I thank you especially for the parts that they have. We have enjoyed those so much this year. And we thank you, Lord, for the love and the compassion. And as we look at the mission to live, to work and play, I'd like to add that we would also like to see people worship, to worship you, to praise you, to give you glory and honor. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and we ask your blessing upon this commission and upon the people of Alden County that truly they may be seen as people that love you and serve you and are wanting the best for each other. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's say the pledge to the flag, please. Ready? Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Prayer Pastor. And man, y'all sound good this morning. Great pledge. The uh, minutes of April 10th, 2018, the work session minutes and the regular board meeting minutes, and also the April 13th special call meeting, a budget call meeting, are available for your review. Under announcements, we're going to start out with our positively polling video, which is mm -hmm. fresh off the, uh, the press, if you will. Mm -hmm. Our uh, touch of truck that was uh, just this past Saturday. <laughs> Give back to the community. 
Uh, so we're just excited about this, and we're already looking forward to next year. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. So Brady, so we want to see you here next year, next April, third Saturday in April. Thank you, uh, everyone who had a part in that. What a great day great for kids of all ages. Um, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over for a second to Ms. Nancy Hollingshed, who has uh, an announcement about what she can tell you. Hi, everyone. Um, just wanted to remind everybody that Thursday is National Day of Prayer. Uh, we will be having, uh, working with the uh, Faith and Freedom Coalition and the Ministerial Association and the Gideons are all working together and there will be an event at Veterans Park. They'll have an event at 12 o'clock, a prayer, but their big event this year will be at 6.30 in the evening. Uh, they'll have prayer and uh, a worship, uh, praise and praise service, and uh, they'll have different groups coming out to uh, pray for different areas of our of our, our government and our citizens. I mean, like Gary Gillig is going to pray over law enforcement and things like that. So I look forward to seeing everyone there, uh, May the 3rd, 12 and 6.30. Thank you. The Board of Commissioners will hold the regularly scheduled May 22nd, 2018 Board of Commissioners meeting on Thursday, May 24th, 2018. So we'll make that change on your calendar. The Board of Commissioners would like to recognize the County Finance Department staff for receiving the Distinguished Presentation of Budget Award. I had uh, Ms. Tabitha Pollard's staff in yesterday and was able to talk with them personally. Uh, I know all the commissioners probably express uh, to constituents that I think the most important thing that we do <coughs> is create, develop the budget. Uh, Pauley County doesn't have any money, it's uh, the citizens' money, and uh, uh, I think none of us uh, ever want to forget that. Uh, so the, uh, the administrators of this budget is uh, Ms. Tabitha Pollard and her staff. And Tabitha, I'm going to ask if you'll just come up here and stand right here. That's why I brought this podium down here today. And this is hidden. with it but just a brief uh, description uh, of the letter or reading of the letter from the Government Finance Officers Association we are pleased to notify you that the Pauley County Board of Commissioners uh, has received the distinguished budget presentation for the current budget year from the Government Finance Officers Association GFOA this award is the highest form highest form of recognition in the governmental budgeting and represents a significant achievement by your organization. When a distinguished budget presentation award is granted to a county, a certificate of recognition for budget presentation is also presented to the individuals, the department, for being, as being primarily responsible uh, in having achieved this award. So this has been given uh, to the Pauling County <coughs> Finance Department and have you do such a great job. We yeah, appreciate your services. And a lot of the ladies that came in yesterday were bragging with you. And I know all of us are like bragging with you too. Thank you. for the budget this year there's a um, notebook or a clipboard in the back that has frequently asked questions so if anyone has any questions that are specific to budget throughout this process we'll issue a budget on June 1st um, we'll adopt in August but in the meantime if you have any questions put it list it on there and we will um, get something out just after the 1st of May so 
next Friday we'll issue our first and then we'll update every week after that. I need to add one other thing you might mention. Friday before last, Friday the 13th, right in this room, we had something that Tabitha does for us. Uh, we've done the last two years where the citizens get to come in and join, join in on creating the budget and it ha has their input. There's tables all over this room. Uh, so that was a good event and worthy of announcement. Mr. Chairman, I have an announcement. I forgot to take it back. Go ahead. Uh, I am having a town hall meeting on Tuesday, May 1st. It's at the Cotton Gin. That's the old uh, Cotton Gin. So I think it's called Cotton Gin at Mill Creek now. It's in the uh, waiting venue of the over on the left side. And now we'll be in probably at 7 o'clock, we'll after 8 o'clock. Before then, I'll actually have a meet and greet that will go from 5 to 6 30. Thank you. Okay, uh, the Board of Commissioners would like to recognize Robert Cabrera. He's usually here, but I haven't seen him this morning. Um, the work that they do on Keep Paulding Beautiful. Some of y'all may be a part of that team. They've been very active, and this is the first, uh, they do what's called a ride around. And there's one of the slides uh, that talks about it. If you look uh, on the totals line and go all the way, well, he's got it in green. Good job, Jeff. Um, that's the lowest, and it's like a golf score. You want the lowest score. That's the lowest score that Paulding County has had in riding around all the four posts in the uh, eight years that we've been doing the ride arounds. So you got an index. Um, and so a 1.4075 uh, is, a, is a record and it's uh, the direction we want to go. We've talked about litter in here before and uh, how much we want to improve on that problem. So I was going to bring Robert up and just thank him for all his work. Uh, and they, use a lot of volunteers also. Um, so we'll move on to the um, Michael Justice um, Parks and Recreation Director to announce the public meetings that are coming up. Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This weekend just reminded me that I have the opportunity to work with a fantastic group of uh, staff folks every day. I just wanted to mention them publicly. To keep me young, um, Tina Eddy that you that you saw, one of our lead coordinators, she's got about another year left with us and she'll be retiring. So we've had the opportunity to bring in some younger staff and if they're full energy and ready to go. So um, kind of ties into where we're going with this with this uh, announcement. Last fall, you awarded the contract to Barge, Wagner, Sumner, and Cannon to undertake the project for us. It's a 10-year comprehensive plan for parks, recreation, trails, and green space. Several steps to that. First step is compiling information on existing facilities, inventory, condition, uh, lifespan, uh, areas of improvement, all that. We've, we've just about got that completed. The next step involves public input. Um, on May 8th at Mount Tabor Park, <coughs> excuse me, at, at 6 p.m. up in the Recreation Center, there's a public information meeting, uh, or public input meeting. Come, come, please do, and, and uh, listen to, you know, what's happening there and provide some information to us and our consultants as to what you'd like to see, where you'd like to see it, how we do doing, you know, with what we have now any suggestions that you have. So that's May 8th at uh, Mount Tabor Park and then again May 9th at 6 p.m. down in the Wayne Kirby Community Center at Burke Hickory Park. We'll be following that up with some online survey opportunities with a list of questions. So you know if you've ever thought why don't we have this or why is that there? Why don't we put something over here? Why don't we do this differently? Now's your opportunity to do that and we invite you to do so. May 8th at Mount Tabor, May 9th at Burn Hickory Park, both nights at 6 p.m. So I um, appreciate your input. <coughs> Any questions on that? If not, thank you for your, for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank sure. you, Mike. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Under invited guests, we have none or bid awards, discuss action to award phase two of the water transmission main and booster pump station 
to the lowest responsible bidder, Garney Construction, in the amount of $12 million, $12,685,555. Good morning. Good morning. On April 13th, we did receive these bids. Um, they were reviewed by the ground level team, and so I'm going to uh, ask Kelly to tell you more about those those projects. Um, actually, each one of these, if that's okay. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Um, good morning. Good morning. I'm excited to be in front of you today with the um, recommendation for award for the final component of the Richmond Creek Water Supply Program. This is the final major construction piece that uh, puts the, the puzzle together. Um, as Tabitha mentioned, this was a, a pipeline that was competitively bid. It's, it's a pipeline and a pump station together. Um, we received seven uh, bidders, so there was a lot of interest in this. Uh, regrettably, two of the bidders were non-responsive because of paperwork issues associated with their bid. However, neither of them would have been low um, had they filled the paperwork out. So there were five responsive bidders. Um, the lowest bid was for $12,685,555, and that is uh, Garney Companies. Um, they were actually only $350 low compared to the second place bidder on a $12,600,000 contract, which is phenomenal. Uh, it actually got us talking about what would happen if there was a tie, because we've never seen it that close before. But it means that they were very aggressive in, in the pricing, which is good. Um, this project continues the uh, finished water pipeline that's currently on, <coughs> under construction now along Highway 61 from the location on Walraven Place where that contract ends. It goes all the way down behind the Watson Complex here and ties into Highway 278, the existing transmission line. And that's the key component that's going to allow us to bring water from the Richmond Creek, Creek supply, Water Supply Program into the existing distribution system. There will be a booster pump station that's located behind the Watson Complex over by Driver Services. It will be a brick facility that looks that has a similar look to the Watson Complex itself. Um, when this project was originally established back in 2015, we had a placeholder of $10 million for this, this project. As you can see, the prices are higher than that um, at about $12.6 million. Um, but that is justifiable due to the fact that we did end up rerouting the, uh, the pipeline. If you recall, we originally had intents to come straight through the city of Dallas, and after discussions and permitting through the city of Dallas, they required us to go around the outside. Um, that added about 2,000 linear feet to the pipeline, which is close to, to $2 million. So um, the good news is, with the overall program, all of the other projects coming in under budget, we still have plenty of contingency to be able to cover this um, and have enough to finish the project with, within the anticipated $215 million. Um, the project, as I, as I mentioned, includes a, a booster pump station. That's about $4 million associated with this. And the current price that's shown includes the contractor paying the taxes for both the pump station and the pipeline. We will likely come back to you and look to have the county directly purchase that. That would allow this number to come down by about $340,000 because if the county directly purchases those items, uh, you don't have to pay uh, sales taxes. Tax. If the contractor does, then they, they have to pay it. So we gave it an option. We wanted to sort of anticipate the worst case conditions. But as we did in the phase one pipeline, that's all gone very well. And the county's recouped the savings on sales tax there. So that will likely bring this, this number down. Um, one of the good things is that the, the low bidder is Garney Construction. If you recall, they are doing the phase one pipeline. So you're going to have the same contractor doing the whole the whole length. They are a large contractor. They have the capacity to do this. They will mobilize additional crews. So work, workforce isn't a concern. And the benefit is you don't have the potential of two different contractors fighting with each other at that, at that point of interface. There's a, there's a total responsibility uh, the entire way. So we're excited to be here and, and recommend this uh, for approval. Any questions? As always, I'm going to ask you. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you may mention we're still on the budget. Yes, sir. And we're still on the schedule. Yes, sir. We anticipate this project will be done about a year from now. So um, all, of the com all of the components have to come online in parallel, but this one's got an end date of approximately a year from now. now. That's a much, much asked question is when will this come online, and we're still looking at 2019. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. One thing I did want to point out, and I wanted to thank the public, those of you that travel along 61, as you know, that pipeline is still under construction. We're about 20% done with the phase one pipeline. 
This phase two pipeline, although it's a continuation, it really goes through private property. So we're not going to be going along the right of way, so we're not going to have the issues associated with construction along the roadway associated with this, this phase of the project. So we've made note of this little bit of a change because of the way we've routed it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I know we're getting close on things, and you've already answered the question. You answered it early, and you yes, answered sir. it just now. Yes, <laughs> Yes, we're still under 250 million. Yes, we're still okay. Yes. Okay. The only other thing I'd like to say to the public is uh, um, as you're going down 61, just slow down. Yes. Slow down. It's. Uh, it's amazing how fast the folks are driving down through there. And um, I've had a few things going on in Cartersville over the last seven weeks, and I've been down that road three times a week. And uh, folks are just they're just driving too fast. And we've got workers on the side of that road, and inspectors on the side of that road, and uh, we've really got to look out for them. Uh, there's all kind of uh, equipment there. There's all kind of signage, but we need to slow down. We have got to slow down. It only takes a second. So. Thank you. Thank y'all very much. Thank you. Yep. And um, Tabitha, do you want me to do the second one? Okay, the second one is actually a separate um, bid item that was... Let me read it. So oh, sure. Yes, sir. It goes on the record. Um, bid award number two is discuss action to award the power service of the Holly County Highway 278 booster pump station to Greystone Power. Um, this is for power supply for the booster pump station. Um, whenever you're establishing new service above 900 kVA, you have Georgia state law allows you to competitively procure uh, the, the power supply. So that's what we did. We put out an RFP. We had two proposals received, one from Greystone Power, one from Georgia Power. We evaluated those looking at reliability, redundancy, cost, and, and rate structure. What we found with both proposers, uh, a similar level of reliability. They'll actually be able to feed the facility from two different substations and have uh, automatic interconnect uh, to give you uh, extra reliability. Uh, additionally, we will have standby power generation. We have a generator at the pump station as part of the, the pump station contract. And that's because it's really imperative that those pumps run continuously to be able to, to provide water under, under all conditions. Um, looking at the rate structures, um, they were they were similar, but there was a lower cost associated with the Greystone um, proposal. They would essentially have a, a savings to the county compared to the Georgia Power proposal of about $100,000 over a four-year period. So from that perspective, it was more cost-effective for them to implement it, and so we're recommending uh, a award to Greystone Power. Also, just like to make note that both of these items went before our... Uh water sewer advisory board and uh, I appreciate you updating them on that. Yes sir. Those folks do a good job. Yes sir. Other comments, questions? Thank you. Kelly. Okay, thank you. Right. Under public participation on agenda items, uh, we have no one who's signed up. Um, under, well, I'm going to head there. Yeah. Under reports from committees and departments, we have our county administrator, Mr. Frank Baker. There's a lot going on on Baker Street uh, all the time, and uh, today he's going to bring us an update uh, on the animal control department. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner, glad to be here this morning to talk about this. Um, and I, I asked Ms. Culberson, who um, is heading up our animal control unit, if I could speak about this. And one of the reasons is I want to give her kudos and uh, Chief Hess. And also one of our commissioners sitting up there, uh, Commissioner Collette, because he had this vision a long time ago. He stuck with it, and um, we're, we're here to talk about a, a program today that I know he's really been wanting to, to move forward. So we want to give you a quick update. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the program really briefly. I've got some experts coming in here just to, to uh, kind of recap what they've been doing with us, and then um, I'll come back and just give you a conclusion. But, what we're going to do today is talk about a community cat program. Uh, we want to come back in two weeks uh, with two things. One is a proposed resolution for a pilot program, um, and it will kind of make sense after our, our friends from Best Friends uh, talk to you on this in a second. And also some proposed changes to the code of ordinances that deal with animal control, which would facilitate allowing us to um, execute that pilot program. So anyway, um, we are 
going to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, a CommuniCat program um, and uh, a specific program of uh, T and R. And I'm going to have Carrie come up and introduce her folks. And we've got a, a short video and a PowerPoint. I'm going to stand up here and help her with it. Um, not the presentation, but actually the AV. <laughs> I'll leave the tough stuff to her. But we're very pleased that you're here today. And I'm going to start with the video. Or you want to start with? No, I think I'm going to go through some things first and move on to the video. Good morning, Terry. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you so much for having us today. We're so excited to be here. Um, let me make sure. Okay. Um, so, again, thank you for having us today. Um, we're really excited to be here to speak with you. I'm joined with some of my colleagues who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. Um, but, like um, Mr. Baker said, we're here to talk about community cap programs, which is something that um, Best Friends Animal Society is an expert in and something that we started. All over Georgia, Caitlin and I have done these programs all over Georgia, and our organization has started these programs nationwide. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the programs themselves and the success that they've had and what it's going to be for Baldwin County. Um, so again, my name is Carrie Cody. I'm the Senior Manager for Georgia. Um, I've been with Best Friends for a little over two years, um, and I'm joined by Caitlin Simmons, who's the State Engagement Manager for Georgia. Um, and she's been with us about the same. Um, and Best Friends Animal Society is a national organization. Um, we have brick and mortar facilities in five cities. Um, and our goal nationally is to help shelters increase the number of animals that are leaving their shelters alive. So we work with shelters all over the state, all over the nation, on programs like this that save animals and that are good for people and for institutions. So, First, we're just going to talk for a minute about the problem. Um, so the, this is the data that we received from Pauling County, and it's really, really impressive. And I really want to give a lot of um, props to Eileen, who's here, for the work that she's done, her and her staff have done. Um, you can see that um, intake for cats, this is exclusively cats, um, has been going up over the years. Um, but she continues to save more and more cats every year. The age rate is going down, and the save rate, the percentage of cats that are leaving the shelter alive, is going up year to year, which is really impressive. But I just wanted to include this because I think it's important for us to point out that although um, we all agree that we want more cats to be leaving the shelter alive, we don't necessarily know the best way for that to happen. And we all agree that there's just too many cats. Um, I think that whether you love cats or you hate cats, you can agree that there's just too many of them outdoors and that we need to come up with a solution for reducing the number of free roaming outdoor cats. Um, so what we have historically done nationwide and here in Collin County is pick them up and euthanize them. Um, so this is just the last couple of years of data and the result of that program. Um, and I've spoken to Eileen anecdotally also, and we know, as well as you guys know, that there's parts of the counties that are hot spots for these cats, um, where there's just lots and lots of cats that are having babies after babies, kittens after kittens, and picking them up and euthanizing them like we have been is not working to reduce the number that's out there. We just keep going out there, we're spending county resources, we're spending um, animal patrol officers time, we're just spinning our wheels trying to fix this problem, and this has not worked anywhere. Picking them up and, and euthanizing them has not been successful anywhere. So the reason that it doesn't work is for something called the vacuum effect. Um, so basically, we're, we're picking up cats that live in these colonies. Um, the cats are thriving. Um, many of you probably have them in your neighborhood. You might see them. They're mostly healthy, happy, they have good skin um, and coats, they're good body weight. Um, somebody is feeding them. So there's resources out there that the cats are thriving off of. And when we remove some of the cats, we just provide more resources for the cats that are left and allow the cats that remain there to um, have more kittens and more kittens and more kittens. And um, this is what we call the back effect. So the solution is something that Best Friends calls a community cat program. Um, and although we are a national organization, we are not the only national animal welfare organization. Um, these programs have a lot of different names, but they are recommended by every national animal welfare organization, ASPCA, HSUS, the National Animal Care and Control Association, the American Bar Association, Target Zero Million Cat Challenge, Not Fund, 
the list goes on and on. Um, these programs are a national best practice for any animal shelter that's interested in saving animals, which we all are. Morning. Morning. So I wanted to talk to you about some of the components that go into a full-fledged community cat program um, and how they help address that issue. So we call it TNVR, which is Trap, Neuter, Vaccinate, Return. Essentially, free-roaming cats are trapped, sterilized, neutered, or spayed, vaccinated, ear-tipped, and then we return them to their original location. These cats are never going to enter the shelter, um, and actually offering the community this option of TNVR can serve as a deterrent to impoundment. People, instead of bringing their cats to the shelter, or bringing these cats they find in their yard, <coughs> And they can bring them to the vet, get them sterilized so they don't have babies and kittens, and actually bring them back. So it saves your community resources. Um, and these resources are usually offered free or very low cost to the community, so that it is, again, a, a reasonable option for them to bring the cats from their yard into the vet and then return them. However, this is just one component. It is really inefficient if you don't also pair it with SNR or return to field, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So SNVR is shelter, neuter, vaccinate, return. It's when you sterilize, again, and vaccinate community cats who have already been impounded and are at the shelter. So somebody brings the cat in, all the county animal services, the cat's there, and what are their options at this point? They're not necessarily friendly, they're not able to be rehomed. So at this point, they're usually euthanized. So with this option, you evaluate them for eligibility, you make sure that they're healthy and have a good body weight, and then you move to the clinic where they have surgery vaccines and ear tips, they recover, and then you return them back to where they originally impounded from. You pair this again with a TNVR, the Tuckinger Vaccinate Return, and also with complaint mitigation, because we want to know why are these cats ending up at the shelter, and how can we help the community with whatever issues they're having. <coughs> Cats who are impounded generally have a home and somebody is looking for them, but they don't necessarily know where to go to find them. They just assume wild animal got them, they ran off, they're not sure. So complaint mitigation. Um, another component of shelter, neuter, vaccinate, and return is that it allows us to identify areas of cats that maybe have not, they have no idea what their resources are, at some point, maybe they're a problem, and so somebody's picking up one cat and bringing it to the shelter, but there could be 45, 100 more cats in that area that we don't know what to do with. So with complaint mitigation, you often have a caregiver who's feeding the cats and loves the cats, and then you have somebody who's struggling with some behaviors that the cats are exhibiting, generally many kittens, spraying, yowling, biting, things that are a nuisance to daily life. Rarely are people concerned about the cats actually being alive and in existence, but they are often very concerned with these problem behaviors that are impacting their life and their yard and their house and their children. So with complaint mitigation, we really want to understand what the issue is, and we want to know if sterilizing the cats alone is going to resolve the issue, too many kittens or <coughs> spraying, just sterilizing and vaccinating them and making sure they're healthy and living in the community will resolve those issues but maybe they're also having problems with the cats walking in their cars and walking in their yards, and we also have answers for that. We want to be a resource for them, and we want to ultimately resolve their issue. Just impounding the cat and killing it is not gonna resolve their issue, as we talked about previously, because of the vacuum effect, they may end up with even more cats and kittens than they had previously. So we have a lot of tried and true methods to really resolve their issues um, and, and make the whole community a peaceful place where people are allowed to care for a cat in the community in an appropriate way. This is just a slide on deterrence, which is one of the main things that we use when dealing with cats in unwanted spaces. There are a lot of options um, that we have used, and they're tried and true, and people really enjoy them. There's ultrasonic, which just emits a loud sound for the cats to keep them out of yards, trash cans, things of that nature. There's also one that is motion activated and will actually spray them with water. And there's a whole variety of, of different I got a lot of, of a lot of uses for something. <laughs> <laughs> I hear to some of you who was like, well, will it keep the, the whole children in my community out of my yard? And I was like, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but they're, they're just a, you know, a positive way to accomplish the goal, whether it's to keep the cat out of the trash can or keep the cat out of the yard um, without just impounding that cat and killing it. Okay, so I talked a little bit earlier about um, how successful these programs have been nationwide, and I just wanted to throw out a little bit of information about um, um, how it's going nationally. Um, you can see that we've had <coughs> great success um, in these three particular counties. Um, and then right next door in Cobb County, um, this is the program that Caitlin and I manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so 2015, before the, the CAP program started there, their intake was around 3,000 and they euthanized about a third of them. Um, so their CAP save rate was, was 62%. Um, in 2016, the program started in February of 2016. You can see that their intake stayed about the same, but their euthanasia went down by, by about 80%. Um, so that's about 800 cats that um, we can assume would have been euthanized without the program that, that were saved through the program. And I just want to point out that um, Caitlin and I actually pulled from the shelter just a little over 200 cats. So these um, programs actually have more than a one-to-one -one save rate for cats. Um, and you can see that their overall save rate and their save rate um, for cats went up quite a bit. Um, and that's the other thing about this program is that when you're not spending county resources caring for and trapping outdoor cats, you have those resources to redistribute. So in Cobb County, they were able to redistribute a lot of those resources that they had previously spent on outdoor cats for dogs. Um, their dog save rate has increased and their save rate for um, indoor placement cats, cats that would not be eligible to be returned outside has increased as well. Um, and then I want to talk about um, San Antonio, um, which this program was started in 2012 um, by a mentor of Caitlin and I's, um, Bethany Hines who still works with best friends, um, and they're going to talk about the success that the program had for them in San Antonio, Texas. There are two primary goals. One is to reduce euthanasia, and the other is to reduce intake of cats into the shelters. And the way that cat euthanasia is being reduced is by taking free-roaming cats that come into the shelters, and normally they would be euthanized. So instead, they're being spay-neutered and released back into their original territories. Now, once they're released, an effort is made to trap and spay neuter the rest of the cats in that area. And that way, we're addressing the source of where these cats came from and hopefully reducing intake into the shelter as well as euthanasia. In San Antonio, the initial results for the Community Cats Project are very encouraging. We're seeing a dramatic reduction in the euthanasia of cats, and we're seeing a significant improvement in the live release rate. So we picked 14 zip codes here in Bexar County where the majority of the cats were coming from. We said, hey, we're going to just focus our resources on these 14 zip codes. We took a look at the programs that we currently had in place for cats, and we threw it out. And we said, let's create something new. At that point, um, the City of San Antonio Animal Care Services saw how we were doing it within this target and said, wow. A, that's really easy, we can do that too. B, it's going to give us the kennel space that we need to achieve no kill. When our staff heard that this program was coming to San Antonio, they were ecstatic because they were educated to know that TNR works. They're educated to know that TNR is the answer. Our biggest issue was obviously the funding that comes along with it that, that you need in order to be able to watch this type of a program. And when the Best Friends and the Smart Charities was able to open their hearts and help us with the funding solution, we were all ecstatic. Why wouldn't we be ecstatic when there's an answer out there that's going to save cats' lives every single day? It's a celebration. So I just want to talk for a moment about, um, we talked a lot about the budget, um, but so I just wanted to include something in here about um, the way that these programs do affect the budget and the way that we've found um, it to be a cost-saving program also. I know initially it seems like um, it would cause your, your budget to increase quite a bit, but we haven't found that to be true. Um, and I know that I shared this with you guys as well. 
um, that these these programs save the county money. Um, and Good morning, Commissioners. Um, good, morning. good morning. Josh Wiesner, I'm the Executive Director of Fix Your Pets. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about partnerships. My organization partners with best friends all over the state. I run, I'm the Executive Director. I run an animal welfare organization focused on preventative programs. So these are typically spay neuter of, of community cats as well as um, dogs in the community um, to reduce the intake coming into the shelter. Specifically today, what I'm going to talk about is the partnerships. Caitlin talked about TNR and then SNR, SVNR. Um, the shelter piece is just dealing with the cats that have already come into the shelter. Well, my organization and others that are up there, there's lots of other funding organizations. My organization is a funding, a grant making organization. But we also help local groups with their fundraising and we help local groups with their program development so that these programs are tied together. And that's why when Carrie and Caitlin were talking earlier and even in the video, they were mentioning there's a component of the cats that come into the shelter, but there's also the component of the other cats that are in that colony that haven't seen the shelter, but let's get them um, vaccinated and sterilized and then return to that same outdoor home. Um, and that's where my organization can help the rest of the Paulding community, not necessarily the shelter, but other groups within Paulding County and within the greater community in getting a program like this started on both components. Um, and with that. I want to thank you for the great presentation that y'all y'all made. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, before I have some closing remarks, I wanted to ask uh, Mandy Brower to come up. Uh, she's uh, She's been working this a long time. And, uh, Thank you. I began advocating for no kill on balding in 2012. And at that time, more than half the animals that came in were killed. 100% of all cats and kittens labeled feral. In 2017, 251 cats and kittens were killed. 101 because they were labeled feral. I've learned that many people don't understand that taking a feral cat to animal control will most likely cause its death. When I explained trap to return to them, most preferred for the cat to stay than to be killed. Trap to return is proven to reduce the cat population, keep community cats healthier, and treat feral cats humanely. That it will cost the county less to TNR a feral cat than it would to intake it, hold it, and kill and dispose of it is an additional win. <coughs> Paulding can be ethical, humane, and physically responsible all in one change. We want Paulding Animal Control to be a safe haven for lost or homeless pets. We also want Paulding Animal Control to be a place where the citizens are proud of and that where they want to get involved and help support the pets. Changing the policies and the ordinances to reflect the citizens' values will help make that happen. I want to thank this commission board for considering this important change. I especially want to thank Mr. Vernon Collette for his work in bringing best friends to Paulding and moving us towards no kill. Please support feral cats and trap to return. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this has been a long ride. See, when I first got elected, I got a phone call one night, and there's this lady on the phone. It was cat this, cat that, cat, 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 cat. <laughs> I hung up the phone. My wife said, "What was that?" I said, "I don't know. It had something to do with cats." <laughs> and I said, I, and "Even worse than that, I'm meeting with her." <laughs> uh, I prayed about that meeting because I had talked to some folks. They said, man, that's a cat Mandy. She's a crazy cat lady. <laughs> and all the folks she hangs out with are crazy cat people. Uh, but I met with Mandy and I asked her a question. And I, and I'm going to share this and I didn't tell you I was, but I'm going to. You might not even remember this. But I want to say this too. All those cat people, they're not crazy and they're very passionate. And I'm on board with what they believe. Uh, Mandy told me the story and it was all foreign to me and the, the terminology and the, I didn't understand any of it. I was lost, okay? But I knew one thing, she was passionate about it, and I, I could see this made a little sense. So I asked Mandy, I said, Mandy, i got to ask you a question, and she probably didn't remember this, but I said, where are you on the pro-life issue? And a lot of people might not like this, a lot of people may like it. And she stopped dead in her tracks and said, I don't know, I've never been asked that question. I think she thought about it, a couple days went by, and she actually called me, and her response was, you know what, I've decided I'm pro-life. She said, because I'm going to be pro-life for cats, 
I have to be pro life for humans too. I don't know if you remember that, but I appreciate that. After she said that, I thought I'm on board. <laughs> don't know what I'm going to do. Don't know how I'm going to do it. It's been a long ride. It's been a tough ride. And I like to thank some other people because if it wasn't for Frank Baker, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, I, as soon as he got on board, Mandy called me. I said, Mandy's still working on it because that's usually what I told her. And uh, I said, Frank, I got this problem. I got this lady. You got to talk to her. Maybe you can help me out. So he met with her. And he said, Vernon, we need to go talk to Kyle County. And we did. And him, I, they called Michael went over to talk to Kyle County. It was a great trip. We learned a lot. That's how we got connected with uh, best friends. Man, I appreciate y'all. I respect y'all so much. And I'm glad to part with y'all. Makes me happy. And so uh, then we came back and shared it with Eileen. And Eileen jumped on board. And I think she's a little cautious at first. But Eileen, thank you. I've seen the way you treat this program. And I appreciate it. And, and Trevor, you too, where you are, I know you're in the room, there you are. Thank you because you jumped in 100% and supported it. And, and, and I just thank you because it's really not me. It's really Mandy Brower, Frank Baker, Eileen, and Trevor. Thank you. Woo. I'd like to add to this and tell you, Mandy, all the phone calls you gave me that drove me crazy. <laughs> thank you. Vernon, thank you taking the lead on this. Uh, I remember the first night we met with Mandy and some other folks at the Democrat that's a Dunkin' Donut. And I left there thinking, wow, she's crazy about a cat. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for people like you, I don't know what we would do. Amen. Thank you once again. Yes, yes. We went to uh, Frank and Vernon and I went to Best Friends it's been several a couple months ago and met with you guys. Great facility. We learned a lot. But as we're sitting there, the one person that came up was Mandy. <laughs> and um, so, and she did come to the Board of Commissioners in 2012. And I think she got with David Carmichael in 2013. And uh, she's just been passionate about it the whole time. And uh, I guess when you just stay on something long enough, good things come out of it. Uh, but you were first person that we talked to best friends about and said we we got to get Mandy on this and uh, we're just excited about it and uh, you know some folks think some of the ideas are crazy but they actually work and the numbers show it and so I appreciate your passion and I appreciate everybody's work and uh, it, we got to have people that are passionate about all kind of things in life and so thank you all for what you've done thanks Mandy for continuing to, to be there and it in front of us, so we, we do appreciate it very much. Well, I'll, just, I'll just add up, Frank, I appreciate you picking the ball back up. Uh, I spent a good bit of time with uh, Mandy also over at the house and discussions. And we did get uh, somebody on board, an adoptions coordinator, uh, back then. Uh, but we're so excited about best friends. Uh, and my only problem is I've got dogs and, and uh, adopted cats. And the dogs get mad when I call the cats my best friend. <laughs> well, thanks for your uh, your patience today. It went a little bit longer than I thought, but um, it's great information. We appreciate it. And just to recap, uh, to let y'all know, again, uh, we'll be coming back uh, at the next meeting with uh, two things. One would be uh, proposed code of ordinance changes that deal with animal control and also with a resolution to allow uh, for us to begin a 12-month pilot program um, and to work with best friends on that pilot program. And so, with, unless there's any other questions, uh, we're, we're done. I'll, I'll just say, if I could, um, Gary and Caitlin, it's good to see you both again. Since our last meeting, I've had a neutered male cat decide that my patio is his home. <laughs> so I've um, been thinking about you. Um, there is no one in this county more passionate about cats and uh, this issue than Mandy, I think. When I was first running, I think, Mandy, we spent two and a half hours on a phone call on a Sunday afternoon. I had the same reaction that these guys had. Um, I appreciate your passion for this. One of the things that I'll just say is that uh, um, when we were talking, I um, had a meeting with Frank and Carrie and Caitlin, and, and they uh, were talking about the, the ideas, and I told Frank, I said, let's, let's present this one week and then let's wait two weeks and, and, and have the resolution and the ordinance changes. So I see a lot of friendly faces here, um, people who are uh, very passionate about the animal issues. It's good to see a lot of you today. 
and um, you have two weeks, and, um, and we have emails and phone calls and, and cell phones. And if you have feelings uh, strongly about this, I'd encourage you to reach out. You've got time uh, to let your voice be heard uh, as you're looking to try to move forward with this in a pilot kind of situation. So any input from the public is certainly welcome. And, um, and, I, and I appreciate, it. again, all the work you guys and Frank have been putting in. I'd love to recognize people, maybe we've gone over on this topic, but Ali, would you uh, stand up and introduce the, the cat lady back there is somebody else that's famous in Pauline County. I would love to be very excited. Thank you for your work. And now we have a cool cat named Eric Johnson who uh, was not on the uh, agenda, but we got him on there real fast to bring us up to date on the jail. And I believe the breaking ground this week, right? Thanks for being here, Eric. Uh, we're pretty aggressive, but not that aggressive, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Chairman, uh, fellow commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for having us. I see we have a representative from Wakefield Beasley here, Steve DeFillipe, along with uh, Lance Painter from Turner Construction. There they are. I guess I've just been watching the videos when I recommend that they do on how the status of the project's going, so I'm glad they're here. Uh, I want to give you a quick update. Um, things are moving well. Uh, I think we have touched on uh, uh, on the situation with uh, construction out there. Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts, um, and we're getting very, very close. Uh, as you can see, there's the same uh, uh, picture of the facility. Numbers haven't changed. Um, we still, uh, and the slide will come next, but I'd rather just talk to you instead of some slides. So we have come to you before and said May 8th we're going to come to you with a recommendation for a guarantee maximum price. Um, and I have stood up here and said, you know, I take this very personally uh, after 34 years in the business. I think we're very close. The team is very anxious for the May 8th. Date, but personally, um, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, the $69.6 million is all we have. Um, I'm, I'm here to tell you we're not going to go over that money, um, but we're still working. Uh, there's some things we're working with, uh, with the county on, on some roads with, um, uh, around there, so we're pulling it all together, and, it, and we're really, really close, uh, I, I would like to tell you. We're uh, hundreds of thousand dollars away, uh, not millions, but in my opinion, we're not quite there yet to where I can explain to you how all the numbers are falling out. And uh, you know, we've been updating the sheriff's office. They've been with us the entire way. Uh, the program will be met, but at this time, I, I, maybe I've had conversations <laughs> with Ms. Pollard that the agenda item needs to be May 1st, but if even gets that close, I just don't think there's enough time to have some explanation of, of the whole process and the numbers. So I'm here to tell you that uh, um, the 69.6 is not in jeopardy, but how we explain the GMP, um, uh, I'm not quite there yet. So, but I'm very confident we'll get there. But uh, that's just, it, but it will be by May 22nd. Uh, it's not that far off. Um, and everybody's pushing for the May 8th. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to push it on you. I want there to be enough time for everybody to clearly understand it before it gets brought to this commission for a vote. Um, but again, that will not uh, impact the overall construction period, or uh, I think we can make up that two weeks uh, inside that schedule, that 18-month schedule. So that's kind of where we are um, on the GMP. As you said, the 5-8 number, I'm terrible. My marketing department hates when I present because I never follow the slides. Uh, but as you see, the 5818, maybe, maybe not. I know we need to get the information by the first, but it needs to be to Tabitha before the first, honestly. Um, we did get the material uh, testing and inspection services RFP in. We got four proposals, and as I had thought, uh, there, they, it is less than the $750,000 budget that we have. When we initially set up that budget, um, we didn't really know what we were getting into on the site work. Uh, we thought that there may be a lot of investigation work. We're able to have done that inside uh, our professional services that we did with Wakefield Beasley Associates. So 
We'll be bringing that to you probably on the 8th. Uh, but it can may, if we wait to the 22nd, that's okay too. They don't have anything to test until we get construction started anyway. So, um, anyway, so um, that's kind of it. The Joe website we've got up and going. Uh, when there's pertinent information we think the public uh, needs to see, we run it by the sheriff's office and post it on that. So if anybody has any questions or, or wants any information, uh, they can go to that website. And clearly there's people that they can, uh, they might even have my email ad address on that website. If everybody has any questions, we're always available for um, any type of information that anybody requires. So with that, uh, Eric, I've got a question. Yes, sir. okay. Uh, it's probably a Gary question. I don't think he's here today. Is he? That's not good. Maybe he has confidence that I can handle this thing, and he's not. Good. That's actually a good thing for me. And if, if you can't, then you know. Yes, sir. We can see Gary and get it. Mm -hmm. um, we're saying that right now you don't have the cost where you want it to be. Yes, right? sir. You hear rumors like, "Hey, every time a jail is built, they build more beds than they really need. They overbuild them." Yes, sir. And you hear rumors in Douglasville that because of that, they have the new prisoners around to keep it. I don't know. Where they're using all the facilities, so it's not just running down. Is there, are we being overbuilt? You know, I know that there's a, a, a jail, something in the state of Georgia that helps come up with that number, but is that a possibility, even reducing that to lower the budget? Uh, yes, it's always a possibility. To answer your question. Uh, the number of beds, the, the, you're referring to the Georgia Sheriff's Association. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been doing this for 34 years, and the pendulum, what, what happened, or, or what, what caused the effect that you're seeing at Douglas County, right after we did that, they changed the truth and sentencing laws, legislatively, where nonviolent offenders were not. So things kind of changed, and that really, where that really impacted was the state. So the state started, you know, it, it provided the ability for the state to allow inmates to go out on probation. What that allowed also was the state had a lot of inmates backed up in all these jails. Um, well, what's happening now, Commissioner, it's a great question. We're seeing that trend. The pendulum always swings back and forth. In 34 years, I've seen it go both ways. We feel where Paulding County is, is you're right in the middle of that. You're right, right, at the, right in the middle where you need to be. And we feel very comfortable with that. So there may be a time where maybe you don't need 660 beds. Okay, but that, and, and theoretically, what it means, 20% of those beds that you have, which is 120, those are for peaking, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but the peaking and loading and classification factors. Okay, so if your jail is 80% filled with inmates, you pretty much are getting on the verge of where your classification system where you put inmates is in jeopardy. Okay, so we, we feel comfortable where you are uh, but we have looked at it, and um, we just, we're just not sure legislatively. We know it's only going to go back towards the right, and you need to be prepared for it. So we, we do take the questions on Douglas, uh, but again, um, I, I think Pauline is unique, different. Than, every county has different demographics. Um, it, it's kind of crazy. They're, we're working with a county up in North Georgia. They have 165 inmates, and you would never, I mean, the counties next to them, they have 365 going right through them, right? So it's just its just county to county how things are looked at. So we could, but I, I don't think it's a budget issue that if there was a reason to um, reduce the program, uh, we would do it somewhere else besides the feds. We don't, we don't feel, you can always add stuff more, it's really tough to add the beds back at a later date and very, very costly. Okay. So. I want to add one thing to that. You mentioned that the laws have changed that some prisoners aren't being held in jails anymore, right? That is correct. The only reason I want to add that is because I get a lot of questions on why are there not more crews picking up litter? That's one of the reasons. I was picking up that. Yeah. The, uh, I guess, yes, the nonviolent ones that are typically on county work crews they have to be sentenced, that they're sentenced to do the minimum security inmates that do county time. Those are the folks that are actually the ones that are eligible um, for probation. But they come back as probation violators. It's, it's all changing. It's all, it's all going back the other direction. Okay. You need to be prepared. For it. Okay. Thank you. You are. Thanks so much, Eric. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs>
Under public participation on agenda items, we have no one who has signed up on the consent agenda to discuss action on three consent agenda items. Number one, approve the renaming of the east-west portion of Folsom Road to Folsom Extension. Number two, appoint Leslie Phillips to the Keep Pauling Beautiful Board as the post two representative with a term ending December 31st, 2020. And number three, authorize the chairman to sign the Georgia Department of Transportation LLP, uh, Local Area Projects Recertification Application. Are there any commissioners that would like to move any of these three items to the regular business? Hearing none, uh, under old business we have none. Under new business, uh, discuss action to adopt resolution 18-18, amending the <coughs> amending the uh, Paulding County Code of Ordinances regarding section 2-6-H, uh, videotaping of meetings. The skip. It should say uh, section 2-61-H. Um, this is a resolution and ordinance change that actually had been asked uh, for by all four post commissioners. And so I'm, I've, I have written a new section into the videotaping of meetings ordinance that reads, the county shall provide for the videotaping of all regular, special, or called meetings of the board commissioners of Paulding County, as well as for the videotaping of all meetings of any county boards, which is defined as boards which are appointed by the board of commissioners that also hold meetings in the board of commissioners meeting room at the administration building. And that just clarifies in the past, there had been some confusion about whether or not we were taping just the regular meetings or and not any other special meetings or call meetings. So this clarifies that we need to be taping them all. And then a county board that holds a meeting in this room, and right now the planning commission is the one that comes to mind, um, and the zoning board appeals. Those are the two that come to mind that meet in this room that are county boards. Um, and elections, yeah, the elections board as well meets in this room. Although that's not exclusively a county appointed board so they could be exempt what i wanted to make clear is because i've had a few questions about this this week it does not include um, economic development industrial building authority airport authority because those are not boards appointed by the board of commissioners um, much like the elections board is not completely done by the board of commissioners that's done by they have legislative appointment they have a board of commissioners appointment grand jury and other, other ways that that is actually appointed um, and the Board of Elections could discuss whether or not they want to be included in this policy. Um, so that would be the change. It's really more to make sure that all the meetings of this board for sure get taped. Are there any questions? No, I appreciate you, appreciate you working on it. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump on that. <clears throat> also, thanks to Jeff. You guys that are coming to these meetings, you don't see Jeff usually because he's on the other side of that wall controlling the cameras with Jeff. Um, very eager to for us to pursue this so that these meetings can be uh, available more available uh, to the public uh, I don't remember when it was, it was several months ago maybe but um, a couple months ago you see the cameras that were installed around the room uh, giving us better quality video as well as live broadcasting capabilities um, and so that's something that has been on uh, been, been one of the things that on, on my list of things to do and so uh, as we've been able to move forward with this new camera system and live broadcasting uh, adopting that approach for other meetings uh, is a good thing. It's just more transparency. Right and these all the meetings will then be broadcast on uh, channel 23 so it could be included in subsection 4 which indicates that we broadcast um, at a minimum of two times on the local access channel so as you know we run a continuous schedule on that channel. Well, and Jeff and, and before uh, Joe and Martin left, have been wanting to upgrade the cameras for quite a while in, the, in order for us to do everything that we can. So we're excited that that was able to happen in this past year's, this year's budget. So uh, I appreciate their work and their enthusiasm about it. So we're excited about that. New business number two is discuss action to approve the guaranteed maximum price in the amount of $2,499,623 and authorize New South Construction to proceed with the renovation for the Water System <coughs> Customer Service Center. Ms. Ashmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, 
back in 2014, uh, the water system was relocated from our former administration building on Bill Carruth uh, Parkway to scattered locations around the county. Um, most people are familiar with the, the staff that were relocated here. It's our customer service function. Um, but we've also got uh, people in our uh, administration building at our copper mine wastewater plant and we cleaned up a, an old laboratory building that is at the LAS part of the, uh, of the copper mine plant to house our staff. The, um, the plan at that time was to construct a building on Mackland Road to uh, reassemble those offices to a, cent to a central location. Uh, in 2015, we, Paulding County, selected New South to um, be our construction manager at risk for a warehouse, pole barn, and these new offices. The warehouse and pole barn are complete. We're in them. They're, they're functioning wonderfully um, for, for our team. And, but we have, as we've discussed over the last year, we've now, per Paulding's now purchased the former SunTrust building for use by the water system to put us in a, in a location where we're in that single location and also have the opportunity to improve our service to our customers. It has the required space to be able to accommodate our existing staff and allow for growth, but it also provides that dry, wonderful drive-through at the back of the building uh, as it was formerly uh, served, at, served its, its use as a bank. It's a set geographically central location to our system uh, and then and much more accessible than that Macklin Road site. So um, we are we're coming to you after um, after having worked with our architects, Crofton uh, Associates, to uh, bring a guaranteed maximum price for the renovation of this building, which includes um, addressing a, a placing a new roof on that building um, and, deal, and addressing H the HVAC systems. Um, we have a, a per solicited local participation in, in this project. Uh, it is a GMP of $2,499,623. It includes a $190,000 contingency that if uh, unused, it remains in, with the county. It has been uh, reviewed and recommended by the Water and Sewer Advisory Board last week. The total of the land acquisition and this renovation um, represents a savings of $850,000 over construction of that Macklin, of the building at Macklin. Any questions? You also had a couple other things that could come up over at Macklin that were kind of some concerns that we didn't know about from the beginning. Including a, a left, the need to install a left turn lane um, on Macklin to get in, into that building. And actually the cost of that is not included in the $850,000 savings. Uh. <laughs> 850 plus the turning lane would be over a million dollars total. I would anticipate that, yes. <coughs> Additional comments? Hearing none, thank you so much for the session. Appreciate it very much. And the Water Sewer Advisory Board. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add an agenda item to new business. Okay. Um, <coughs> Commissioner Collette wants to add um, an agenda item to new business. Um, Can you name what the agenda item is? I'm going to okay. yes. Okay. I'd like to add action to approve the Board of Commissioners to drop all lawsuits against any other component of the county government. I'll second that motion. Okay, we've got a motion to drop all lawsuits against any other component of the county government. Uh, and what we need to do is vote to add it as an agenda item. Mm -hmm. So is there a second that um, that motion be added? 
I second that. And a second by Mr. Davis. Um, is there any discussion? <clears throat> well, I'm discussing why I want to have it. This would be why you want to add it. It's not discussion okay. of the actual motion itself. Okay. Back on April 27th, this is an action that the chairman wanted to bring and have put on the voting agenda that afternoon. What was the date on that? April, I mean, February 27th. February 27th. No, you can discuss it first about why he wants to add it, but you're not going to discuss the other yeah, substance. All right. So anyway, back on February 27th, the chairman had brought this to the voting station, added it to the agenda. We had to take it off because it was put on incorrectly. I have expected to see it on the last several meetings. It was not on there. So I'm just wanting to add it back on so that we can discuss it. Okay, uh, we have a motion to add uh, dropping all lawsuits against any other county components with a second. And we've had discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 And now it becomes agenda item number three to discuss. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let me give a little bit of background from uh, Commissioner Collette's. Uh, proposal to put something on the, the schedule or on the agenda from a call uh, Friday to commit to uh, our county our county uh, clerk Ms. Meredith and um, they called it and come to me and so uh, Ms. Meredith uh, asked me about it and given Mr. Clinton the, the benefit of the doubt I uh, had it added and then when I talked with you yesterday morning uh, I realized that what you really wanted to put on there was um, the airport and lawsuits and my decision on that was that that would just be further controversial and uh, further um, not being constructive so that was new business item three for a couple of days but uh, as of yesterday morning uh, I wasn't comfortable with uh, going through that very divisive issue and I pulled it off so um, but the uh, the enabling legislation does say that, uh, and the working agenda is supposed to be a full board effort. Uh, I'm just responsible for getting it out there. The uh, the times when you can add if it's uh, an emergency or it's an urgent necessity. Um, so I'm assuming by Lonnie Lonnie gave us a memo on that yesterday, Dave, about um, necessity being determined by your refusal to add this to the working agenda. The board has a legal leeway to determine the necessity in a case such as this. Correct. That's what I'm saying. If, if you want to, um, you know, vote uh, for this to be an urgent, an urgent necessity, then um, that's the only way it can be added. So I guess we've already passed that. You have. It's been added to the agenda at this point. <laughs> So um, it's a topic, uh, as you suggested, Mr. Collette, that uh, I've been uh, very much behind, and so let's discuss it. Before we discuss it, I'd like to amend it. Okay. I'd like to read, action to prove the Board of Commissioners drop all lawsuits against any other component of the county government, and to discuss the history of the airport. I have a discussion on history that. I'll second that motion. Do we have an amendment to add the, the history of the airport? Um, and we have a second discussion. Um, since we in Pauline County have an airport authority that uh, per the IGA of 2014, the airport authority and its chief executive officer uh, are the uh, experts of what uh, is going on at the airport from the operation of it to uh, uh, other issues surrounding the airport. And I don't think it's appropriate to amend this, uh, this motion without having representation from that authority. I, I disagree. We're uh, talking about um, lawsuits and the 
history of a property, piece of property that's ours. Um, they are party in some of those lawsuits, and I believe it would be um, inappropriate to put them uh, at this point with uh, with representation. The, the, original, discussion. the original motion came from the chairman, not the Pollock County Airport. The, the original motion, though, was just to drop the lawsuits. It wasn't to discuss history that can't be properly represented in this board meeting without representing representation from both co-sponsors. So I, I think it's uh, uh, really not in the spirit of utilizing the expertise that we have in the county to have this discussion and include the history when we don't have the airport authority representation here. So we can certainly make that happen in the future. I, would, I think it should be tabled until we can have representation from the uh, I would respectfully disagree. I think anytime we have an open discussion and be transparent about an issue, I think the public, the citizens have a right to hear. Well, as I already stated, uh, the reason I took it off um, is because it is such a controversial issue. I think that we should be uh, positive and um, be promoters of the airport as a general aviation airport. And you know, I didn't have confidence that we could have that conversation and also have accurate information about both sides being represented. Dave, what's controversial is when you have this appear on an evening agenda without it being discussed with anybody beforehand. So when we walk in for a seven o'clock meeting and sit down and look over the agenda, it's nothing what we've had uh, to look at before and it's just sitting there in front of us. Those of you who read this meeting recall, we actually stopped the, the process here and went into executive session to talk about to talk about um, the it was a litigation it fell under litigation and and, and how that was added inappropriately. So that's the controversial piece of this. Uh, um, this is the proper way to add something to agenda. It's the proper way to to handle a discussion about an issue. Um, if we had an issue, uh, Commissioner Davis, that uh, involved as many do involved the water system, uh, our water and sewer system, and involved DOT, and we just had <coughs> half of that representation, then we're not getting the full picture of, of what the issue uh, Airport is regarding to. Well, we're just well, getting a tainted, partial picture, and <coughs> I, I, I think it's really... Quite, quite uh, frankly, Dave, this board is represented by both sides of the issue on that airport. And, uh, and it's being recorded, and I'm sure that anybody who gives any information that's not true will be called out on it. You've got, you've got your side. I mean, you and I have had this discussion. You know, you know we're on different sides of this uh, airport issue with what's going on there and what's going on in the past with the, with the airport and previous administrations. And um, you, you are certainly part of this board and, and able to participate in the discussion that Vernon's proposing. Now, this so, so who will be the ones to call out when we don't have representation? All the ones people we represent. May I make a comment? <clears throat> who was the county attorney at that time? Back in when the airport was first put together. <clears throat> when it was a general aviation? Well, before, even when it was being built. I was. You we got the county attorney here. I believe if I get off staff, say something I shouldn't, we will correct me, will you not? Well, you guys are close, and I want to make sure you know which part you're in. <laughs> you actually are on a motion to amend. That's correct. The so item, so you need to do a vote on the motion the to vote. amend. Can we have a motion to amend to um, you want to read it? Something about the history. I think you had a, well, you had written it. It was the old item, which was action to approve the board commissioners to drop all lawsuits against other county entities and a discussion of the history of the airport? That's correct. Okay, okay. Um, before we take a vote, I, I just want to clearly state that, that without having both sides represented, that it's an incomplete argument and it's an in incomplete discussion. And I would like to see our county focus on the airport as a positive asset for general aviation and I think there, there's agreement on the board here for that I, that's what's been expressed in debates but I don't think it's fair to 
start into history and say, well, Miss Skipper's responsible for this, getting us, if we get off track, or if you all get off track, getting us on track without having the airport authority has an attorney also uh, that would, would round out and fill this discussion so that then I would support it. But I don't think this is the way to do it. Uh, again, this is something brand new as of this hour. Uh, nobody came to the chairman and said, hey, we would, we would like to talk about this. I, uh, personally, I think dropping all Actually, that's, that's not true. Hold on, no, Vernon sent you an email and asked you to add that. And you, were, and you removed it. This is brand new this hour. You ripped it out of the agenda last week. You're incorrect. You're incorrect. Well, you're incorrect. It was, you're incorrect. It was incorrect. airport, and the airport authority and lawsuits. And incorrect. You're incorrect. It was airport and lawsuits was what I saw as the added agenda item. I called Commissioner Clutt yesterday when I initiated the call to him. What do you want to talk about? What's the content of this? And when he told me, so we don't need that as far as being a wholesome, uh, positive discussion about this asset that we're, we're very fortunate to have. The, the public and the audience uh, are not interested in us arguing and in fighting about this. And I don't want to. Then let's have a discussion. But I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I, you know, this is new to me. I will call the vote and you all can discuss it. But uh, there's nobody here to represent the other side. And I don't know what the history is going to be described at. And personally, uh, I'm not up here as an export expert in every detail. Uh, the attorney for the airport authority and the CEO of the airport authority would be much more qualified to do that. So I don't think I should even make any comments about it. But we'll call for the vote. Actually, I'm going to say something before you call for the vote during this discussion. You should be an expert because you were on the Airport Authority Board. That's right. Yeah. And to say that the other side is not here to represent themselves or represent the public, they haven't represented the public the entire time. So I have went to them to amend the intergovernmental agreement. I have went to airport authority members and discussed what we could do out there and that our board was supportive and behind general aviation, supportive and behind building T hangers that the county and the airport authority would own, supportive and behind anything with general aviation. <coughs> I have asked to go in executive session with them on called meetings, advertised called meetings. I've asked for them to come to executive session with us to discuss it. And the fact of the matter is, since the announcement October 3rd of 2013, that answer has been no. So for us to think that they're gonna show up here today or here in two weeks for discussion, I don't really see that happening today. And it, you it were happen. on <coughs> you were on the airport authority for many years. You were on there when you were running in 2012 for post one commissioner. While you were running, you were signing contracts. You were on there. You have the history of it too. I learned several weeks ago in this meeting that I couldn't count on nothing that you did unless I had it on video. That's what you told me. You said, do you have it on video? So therefore, I know there's folks on both sides of the issue, but the bottom line is this. We have put every single thing out in the public eye every single thing with this issue. Some of you may not want to hear it. We've done exactly what we said we would do. And we will continue to do that. But I have learned that having a cup of coffee with you, you said it doesn't count unless it's recorded. We're here. We're going to discuss it. Well, Mr. Powell, what you just said, a lot of that's inaccurate, and you speak uh, 
about general aviation. There's a company called Resicom. It's a helicopter training unit out of Alabama that wanted to locate here. And you did not even return the phone call to that company to uh, support it, to encourage them to come here. And there are a lot of other examples. I call the vote. <clears throat> yeah, let's call the vote, Dave. And we'll discuss that. Okay, issue. well, I'll run the meeting. Okay, correct. I'll call the vote when I choose to call the vote. Keep discussing it then because we can discuss it during this time if you'd like to. So that you all are aware, what I'm trying to get you to do is get through the amendment part and then we're actually going to read the agenda item and discuss it. That's how it should work from a parliamentarian sense. Sounds good. Okay, so we have to vote, have a vote on the amendment. A vote on the amendment and then you're going to read the amended item and then discuss it. Okay, um, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, nay. Please read the motion in the amendment. Okay, I have the amended items. Action to approve the Board of Commissioners to drop all lawsuits against any county entity and to discuss history of the airport. That's what it finally ended up with. Right. Okay, now we vote on that motion, right? You, um, you vote on the motion. Um, well, actually, in this case, we just read the motion that you have discussed. So I just read. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. We don't have, have a motion and a second because it's a more It's been added to the agenda appropriately. Okay. Okay. And I'll be glad to open discussion since I brought the motion or the action to the floor. I've had plenty of conversations with everybody involved back in 2006, seven moving all the way up to the time I got elected. And Lonnie, you correct me if I didn't say something correctly, because I know you were there. The county has voted twice, and I don't know those years, I know Commissioner Crow knows them, to not financially support the building of an airport. Now you talk to a lot of people, and I, I'm real careful, I said financially, I've talked to a lot of people who had that vote, and never one time said, yeah, I voted not to use taxpayer dollars for the airport. There, I voted against the airport. I wasn't in the county at the time, but when the, county, the airport started coming around, it was talking to being a general aviation airport. I actually supported that. I actually supported Jerry Sharon and wanting to build that airport. It might have been a wrong thing to do now, but I did support it back then. And I'm joking, because I still support general aviation, and I don't think anybody has been a, more, a bigger proponent than general aviation than I have been. I think it'd be a, a very helpful tool to the county. But what happened was when they decided to build it, they had to get funding. And my understanding that Troutman Sanders was very, very instrumental in procuring those funds for Pollen County to build that airport. Without what they did, it probably wouldn't be here today. And it's a beautiful airport. It's an airport that, that won an award for its original idea, which was to be an executive airport. The road beside it was to be a, a place where we were to put mountain chalets and executives would come here and they would be able to fly their plane into that airport and go over to their little mountain chalet and have a car and go to Atlanta or wherever they wanted to Atlanta and enjoy a little stay here. Still a great idea and I think that's what we should pursue. It even won an award and Scott, I can't remember what award it was, but I know you know. What was it won an award through the Economic Development um, Agency at the federal level for basically a flying community. With flying community. What was that? What was the name of the award? The help award in economic development plans. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Something we, st we should still pursue, in my opinion, with that airport. I think it would be awesome to have that and attract those type of people. They would have uh, very expensive planes, which would be housed there, so we get to add valorum on them also. It's, it's the original plan, and I think we should stick to the original plan. However, when Blake Swafford went to build the airport, started knocking down trees and laying out the runway, he didn't even put the runway on, com on county property at all. It was on two other people's property. It was on the property that belonged to the Weaver family. We wound up in court with the Weaver family because we went out there and started just knocking trees down on their property, making a runway, didn't even own the land. So we had to settle that in court. The Weaver family eventually said, you know, we'd have probably sold it to you if you'd come and ask us, but they didn't want to but they did. The other land belonged to the city of Atlanta. So we go to the city of Atlanta and say, hey, you know what? We're building this airport and we need some land from you. 
several meetings. That, from what I understand, it was three, four meetings down in Atlanta, three or four meetings out here in Pauley County. Atlanta said, you know what? We want to be good neighbors. We do not want to be the bad guy. Tell you what, after some negotiation, they said, we'll save the land. You need 163 acres, right? Okay, we'll save you 163 acres. We only ask one thing. Never compete with us. Never bring commercial flights to Pauling County. We want to be a good neighbor. Everybody agreed. It's on film. You can watch it. The promise was made. Now, the city of Atlanta made a mistake when they did the land grant. They didn't attach that part of the... Um, what's the word? Agreement. It's, it's not a deed restriction. A deed restriction. They, they should have made it a deed restriction. There's some uh, talk of whether or not it were held up, but they should have put the deed restriction on there, and they forgot to put it on there. You think someone with all the attorneys they have and how, how, how powered as they are, they wouldn't make a mistake like that. But that's humans, and humans make mistakes. So, since they forgot, some of the same people who made the promise to the city of Atlanta, they also made the promise to the people, the citizens of Pauling County, let us build this airport. We promise it will be general aviation. We will never take it commercial. If we do, we'll be the first to run. They weren't the first to run. They broke their promise. They should not have broken that promise. So now we're being sued by the city of Atlanta. They've got a lot of money and a lot of attorneys. How long is that going to take? How far is it going to go? We don't need to be in a suit with the city of Atlanta. It should be a general aviation airport. I've had men come up to me who are elected officials and some appointed by elected officials, men who call themselves Christians, who told me I need to forget about the promise. Don't worry about the promise. This could be a financial boom for Pauling County. Well, I disagree. I don't think it will be a financial boom. You know, from the Chamber's own study that they did, it was only 55 full and part-time jobs that would come due to commercialization. One good general aviation company could bring 55 jobs. General aviation does not want to be where there's a commercial airport because then they have all the red tape they have to go through. They have to deal with TSA every day when they go to work. It needs to be a general aviation airport. I support a general aviation airport. I can't believe that people would say, the heck with Atlanta. They would screw us if we got it if they had a chance to. I used to respond, no sir, they would not. They had that opportunity and chose to be a good neighbor. And this is how we're treating them. It should be a general aviation airport. It should not be commercial. The man that we're in contract with is a man named Brett Smith, a New York businessman. And I use that word loosely. We've seen things he's done. We've seen how he is being on video. Should not be in business with me. Should not. We need to send him packing. Yeah. I am committed to making this thing general aviation. I do not think that it should be commercial. The reason I think we shouldn't be in business with Brett Smith is because he said he wanted to do improvements at our airport. The Pauling County Airport Authority took out a bond to make the short story make the story short short almost say it's a three million dollar bond. We know it's more than that, okay? They paid some back, so $3 million per run. He said he'd make payments. He signed a contract with the Pauley County Airport Authority. He has, he's not making those payments. He owes you, the taxpayer, each of you sitting out there who is a resident of Pauley County who pays taxes today, $1.1 million. There's an additional $1.6 million to be paid. And I've had people come to me and say, I think we should drop the lawsuit. I don't think it's right for one entity, government entity, to sue another government entity. Well, we wanted to sue Brett Smith because he's breaking his contract with Holland County Airport Authority. But through the law and through the court, we found out, guess what? He's first in line, but second in line is the Holland County Airport Authority. 
can't sue him without suing them. We ask them over and over, go after the money. The taxpayers deserve it. They finally sent out one little letter. Didn't have much bite to it. They've done nothing since. So we took action. We took action to protect the taxpayers. You, the citizens of Pauling County. We said this is enough. We want Mr. Smith to pay what he owes us. So yeah, there is one entity suing another. But when you read the internet, they leave that out. They make it sound like it's just being sued to stop general aviation. It has nothing to do with general aviation. It has nothing to do with commercial. It has to do with making a businessman from New York abide by the contract that he signed. And he ought to be ashamed of himself for not abiding by that contract. And anybody that thinks that we should pay his bill, you don't need to vote for me. <laughs> do not. But if you think that we should continue to go after this guy, give the money owed the taxpayers, I can say this, I took an oath to protect the taxpayers, and I will honor that oath. Thank you. I'd like to say something also. While Vernon was talking, I've read the contract on the 163 acres. Um, it was in there several times that we would guarantee not to fly pastures in and out to compete with Atlanta. We applied for the 139 illegally. They should have sued us then, but they didn't. I was always amazed. I read the thing several times. I thought, well, why? We've got to reach a contract. Why they haven't came back to us? And then when the 163 acre was deeded over to the airport authority, they had no choice but come after us. We had no choice except to defend ourselves. So the city of Atlanta has been more than a gentleman about this. And I'm sorry that they have to sue us, but this airport, whatever it may be, has been absolutely a model of how not like to run off and go. If I could clarify one thing, it's something you said, Commissioner Collette. Um, you indicated that we were in contact with Brett Smith, and we are not. Yeah, you're correct. The you're county correct. is not. Thank you. The, the contract between Propeller Industries is with the airport authority, not the county. Thank you. She's correct. She's correct. Can you also elaborate on Brett Smith suing us over that and being denied in the bill? We may need Mr. Connerly to do that. Um, okay. He was sitting in the audience. It was our attorney on that subject. But I did want to clarify, we're not in, in, a, we're not in a contract. Thank you, and I didn't know that. It just misspoke. Like in all things, I have a five-minute presentation, and I have a 25-minute presentation. So I'm going to start with the five-minute presentation, and then y'all tell me if you want the 25-minute presentation. <laughs> Some of this requires, I think, a little more context and maybe what we've given so far so let me just back up a little bit and I'll come to the question at issue which is uh, the fact that Brad Smith's entity and I'm just going to refer to it as Silver Comet has sued Paul County. Um, I want to go back to the adoption of resolution 1501 for a minute uh, because that's when this board uh, decided to withdraw, officially withdraw, the county support for the proposed commercialization of the airport. And if you recall, what happened within a few days of that is that the airport authority sent to the FAA a letter that said, we don't care what the county says about this. We want the FAA to continue to process that Part 139 Act. And I would submit to this board that that decision, that one decision, is the reason that I'm up here tonight. 
it, it's the reason that this county has incurred all the legal fees and expenses that it has incurred for the last two and a half years or so dealing with this issue. It's is seasoned by the Palm County Airport. By the Airport Authority to send the letter to the FAA saying we do not want that 139 application withdrawn. Okay. Because that set in motion everything that's happened since then. That is the reason, for example, that the city of Atlanta filed the informal complaint with the FAA on the deed restriction. And that's the reason we were hired to begin with. And the airport authority never sent that letter. The city of Atlanta would have never filed its informal complaint. And my firm would have never been retained, presumably, to respond to it because it never would have existed to begin with. What we got from the FAA in response was, well, we're going to consider the 139 application as remaining pending until there's some sort of litigation solution to this thing. And you may recall that the second task my firm was asked to do was to respond to the FAA's request for an opinion letter as to the effect of Resolution 1501 in light of the fact that the airport authority wanted the application to move forward. So again, that was item number two that was set in motion by the airport authority's uh, request that this application remain pending. And so we ultimately, because the FAA would not allow for the withdrawal of the 139 application or would treat it as remaining pending until there was some sort of litigation resolution to this, we filed a declaratory judgment action, a simple declaratory judgment action against with the airport authority on the other side simply asking the court to answer this one question, which is who, as between the county and the airport authority, has the right to move forward with the proposed commercialization of the airport. In other words, can one party do it without the other or does it require the consent of both parties? And we did that because the FAA said, we're not gonna treat that application as having been withdrawn, we're gonna treat it as remaining pending until we get some sort of judicial determination on this issue. And that's when we move forward with that lawsuit. Now, in response to that, Silver Comet intervened in the lawsuit. They actually filed another lawsuit in federal court. They removed the state court case to federal court, and they greatly expanded the scope of the litigation that we were involved in. But as part of that, Silver Comet asserted a claim against the county for interfering with its contract with the airport authority. So now we're defending a claim that's been brought by Silver Comet. In response to that, we went ahead and filed um, a claim against Silver Comet on the bond issue, saying you're responsible for the repayment of these bonds. You're not paying these bonds. We'd like for you to either be ordered to pay those bonds or we want damages for the fact that you haven't paid those bond payments that you promised to make. So the question then is, why, why can't we just quit? Why can't we just let all of this go? Well, we can't let it go because, in part, we don't control it. We also can't let it go because it leaves the county exposed to claims for damages. So let me just walk through about four reasons why we don't have the option of just quitting. First of all, as I mentioned, the FAA is treating the Part 139 application as pending, and it has communicated to us in writing that it will not decide the pending application until the litigation is resolved. And I would submit to you that if we withdraw from the lawsuit, then that opens the door for the FAA to make a decision on the 139 application that they have told us remains pending. So that's reason number one, we can't just quit. Reason number two is, yes, we were successful in the trial court in getting Silver Comet's claims against the county dismissed. But those claims, that dismissal is up on appeal right now. And so quitting means that we leave ourselves potentially defenseless 
in the claim that Silver Comet is asserting against us should they prevail on appeal. And I just remind everybody, their claim at least was for millions of dollars. So we can't just leave the county exposed to a claim for millions of dollars. May I interrupt for a minute? Sure. If, if we drop that lawsuit, then the judges are going to see that as we're admitting guilt. Well, what, what would ha it depends on what happens on the appeal. But if their claim were to be reinstated on appeal, and then it was sent back to the trial court for further consideration, what it would mean is we would no longer be defending against that claim. So essentially, we would, by, by default, they would get the judgment that they're seeking. So right. we can't just stop and probably be back and forth arguing about how much we'd actually owe. That's right. I can press this. The third issue is, as y'all have pointed out, our claim against Silver Comet for the bond payments remains pending. So quitting means that we are giving up on our efforts to recover the money we've already paid on behalf of the bond payments we've already made that our position is we weren't obligated to make and future payments that the board may be prepared to make. So it essentially just means eating $3 million or whatever the number is. And then the fourth thing is, again, the city of Atlanta has not only filed its informal complaint with the FAA, they have also filed a lawsuit raising the same issue. So quitting in that context means that the city of Atlanta prevails. So I'd like to summarize by, by saying this. There are three things in my opinion, that are directly responsible for all of the litigation fees and expenses and costs this county has incurred in this matter. The, the first is the airport authority's refusal to allow the Part 139 application to be withdrawn. The second is Silver Comet's intervention in what was a very simple lawsuit involving us and the airport authority that all we were asking the judge to do was just say yes either one party can move forward without the other or it requires the consent of both parties but their decision to intervene in that lawsuit exponentially expanded the scope of the litigation and, and required the, the expenditure of the vast majority of our legal fees and expenses and then the third thing and y'all touched on this but I want to emphasize that we spent a lot of time and money in response to the airport authorities going and getting a quick claim fee from the outgoing chairman of the board days before he was to leave office in direct, direct contravention to instructions that the FAA had given us. And we spent months and months and months once the FAA became aware of that trying to come up with a joint corrective action plan again at their direction in order to address this transfer of the 163 acres. So I don't know the exact percentage, but I would submit that probably 95% of the legal fees and expenses this county has incurred at least since our involvement in September 2015 have been a direct result of one of those three things, either the refusal to allow the 139 application to be withdrawn, Silver Comet's intervention in the lawsuit, or the decision to go behind closed doors and to get a quick claim deed executed for that 163 acres. That's uh, probably more than five minutes, but that is at least my five minute presentation. But I can go into more detail about the chronology and all that, and how we got here if you need me. Representations go around the room. Um, in the room was Stephen Hicks, the uh, Southeastern Regional FAA Director. 
sitting at his conference table and Mr. Pownell was there, it was clarified that it didn't matter about the PCAA's, the airport authorities, letter to the FAA uh, because when the resolution 1501, we're talking January of 2015, uh, when that letter was uh, received by the FAA, that commercialization and the Part 139 request uh, would not be processed, would not be considered unless both co-sponsors, the two co-sponsors, jointly agreed. So as of January, uh, January of 2015, the commercialization piece was negated. That's not I want to add to it that um, this is an election. If the two of the three of us get beat by people who want commercial airport, now both bodies are in agreement and you have commercial flights. Yep. Wow. Yep. Let me just... <laughs> that's not exactly correct, Dave. That's the propaganda that you'll, you're spreading to people that uh, January 13, 2015, Resolution 1501 killed commercial service. That's what that's what some people want to put out there that that was the case. The FAA put out there. No, you're incorrect. That's you're not you're not okay. right. That's why they want to have this discussion. Somebody's correct. Somebody's in the reef. We don't have a balanced representation. Okay, go so ahead. So y'all y'all go ahead and say whatever you want. I'm not going to say anything. If I can, and then I'll sit back down. I do want to address that issue. Uh, let me just address something. Nobody told me that you were coming. I'm the chairman of this board, and I think it would be very courteous if my commissioners and our county attorney would let me know if you're going to come here and what you're going to represent. Okay. We can't talk on this without our conflict council. We can't do that. You know when the discussion's on there that he's going to be here. No, I asked one yesterday. On the FAA and the pending 139 application, the only thing, the only thing that has been communicated to me and this board in writing by the FAA is that that 139 application remains pending. Now, I've heard that in this meeting, the FAA said, that it would require the consent of both co-sponsors in order to move forward with the proposed commercialization of the airport. But I wasn't at the meeting, despite the fact that I requested to be at the meeting, but the airport authority's attorney elected not to attend. So I don't know personally what happened at the meeting. What I do know is that the only thing I have received from the FAA in writing and has remained their official position as far as I know this entire time is that that 139 application remains pending and will remain pending until all of the litigation has been resolved. The only other thing I want to clarify because the chairman brought this up is that I, I'm not privy to what Mr. Connolly was going to say um, and that, that he's going to be here and as far as I know he is not coming into closed session so um, if you look on the agenda and you see that there's a litigation section that's not to talk about this topic. And that was what I understood and laid to the chair. Well then, I think the conflict counsel could have called me himself. He knows my phone number. Okay. Any other discussion? Yes. You know, the propaganda being spread out there about 1501 that killed everything is incorrect. <clears throat> if it did, why are we still fighting? That's a good question. No, it's a good question for you. <coughs> That's not the case. Um, we did 1501 to say that we did not the commercialization of the airport. But the fact of the matter is that the Board of Commissioners 
that was actually the first vote of any time when it came to that issue. The Board of Commissioners this year and every year all the way back to 2012 day when you were on the airport authority when you were running for post one when you signed the contracts in October and November of 12 on the airport authority the board of commissioners never had a vote we don't have a contract with propeller silver comet Brett Smith and the board of commissioners then in 12 then in 13 when you were here in 14 never voted on commercialization of the airport probably somewhere around 80 percent of the monies that have been spent on litigation have been spent defending ourselves from the litigation not on the propaganda that's been spread out there to y'all that all this money spent because we're suing each other in the county that's it's incorrect information i don't know why anybody out there any citizens or anybody on either side of the issues would want us to sit around and do absolutely nothing about somebody that made a commitment to pay 3.6 million dollars in bonds and just sit here and do nothing absolutely nothing I mean is that really what people want you to do it doesn't matter what side of the issue you're on we took an oath to look out for the citizens and the taxpayers to watch out for the public funds and to allow somebody just to sit around and not pay a commitment that he signed a contract on and your airport authority didn't do nothing about it we can't just sit around and just let somebody come in to do business and sign contracts and not hold up their obligation and us do nothing about it at this point I'd like to say something Vernon made a statement earlier about you believe a certain way you certainly don't need to vote for it this whole discussion today is about integrity or the lack thereof one way or the other. I remember my oath very well that I protect the citizens of this county. Dave Carmichael and myself have one time, and there's other people in this room that have taken a note that said that I will defend this country against foreign and domestic enemies. And I took that oath seriously. I live it today, just like I did in April of 1965 when I took it. We have enemies arise in the government all the time. And that's what we're dealing with here. But once again, this discussion, bottom line is, it's about your integrity. Every man on this board, and all of us out here, it's about integrity, doing the right thing, no matter what. And sometimes it's not easy. And I, for one, will not back up when it comes to my integrity. It's not within question. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll just add a uh, clarification. One of the common misconceptions is the word commercialization. Uh, and the way it's used um, by proponents would sometimes lead you to believe that you have to have this Part 139 to allow businesses to use an airport. Uh, that it needs 
to be quote unquote commercialized. Um, the truth is, general aviation airport can't support businesses using it. It does support businesses using it. Um, the the term commercialization in this conversation has to do with ticketed passenger flights. Um, and so an opposition to commercialization is not by any means an opposition to businesses having an opportunity to use an airport, whether it's a, a, a aerospace type of uh, um, manufacturing op operation or whether it's a, a company who uh, is located here and maybe has a vice president come in on a, on a, on a company plane. Um, commercialization is specifically with ticketed passenger flights and has nothing to do with companies uh, using the airport for their benefit. Silver Comet um, contract was signed. I was on the Airport Authority Board, and um, it was signed in October of 2012. And it was at an Airport Authority meeting um, that was properly advertised. And when uh, meetings occur, there are minutes taken on the, on the meetings. And meetings were taken from that meeting in October of 2012 uh, about this agreement with Silver Comet Partners. Um, the meeting, the minutes are open records. The contract is open records. October 2012, there's a commissioner that repeatedly, and, and maybe uh, Mr. Grant or uh, Mr. Spigalone can uh, clarify this on their own, uh, but why would, why would it be that one of our commissioners didn't read those open record, that open record contract and that open record minute and find out about it until uh, 13 the next year. Um, I already said I was going to shut up, but uh, you know, I'm passionate about developing an asset out there that can bring revenue. Unfortunately, we've got Chamber of Commerce in here, and we've got some candidates for election, and <clears throat> it's unfortunate that you can be in Switzerland today, you can be anywhere in the world and watch this meeting and see that we're not united. And that's painful to me. That's painful to me. Change your mind. Change Four of us are. That's right. Dave, again, two weeks ago you told me, um, did you get it on video? Is what you said. And um, it, it doesn't mean anything unless it's on video, basically, is what you were indicating. Um, I've got a 2004 video, Chamber of Commerce announcing the airport and groundbreaking and it will never support if it was about passenger service commercial passenger service he just wouldn't be a part of it. for you to sit here and for you to sit here and continually <coughs> tell half-truths. I'm using the best term I can use, Dave. About whether or not I knew or not. What you just said was, being that there's documents out there somewhere that are a part of open records, what, you're, what you just said was, you should have went and dug in the boxes, you should have went and done an open records request to find out what's going on at the airport. Me, a commissioner that was sitting on this board since January 1 of 2011, I should go file open records request to find out what the chairman or the airport authority is doing with an asset that belongs to us. I should. And that's what you said. You don't have to get. You don't have to give open records request. You're a commissioner. They'll give it to you. This is no. I have to go ask for it. Ah, there you go. I have to go <laughs> ask for it. Hey, go to the closet. Go to the file cabinet. Tell I have as a commissioner. I got to go ask for it. We ask for things from this staff. Why not? Here. We have ask for the staff every day. Yeah. Let me tell you. There's more story. There's more to the story. In 2012. While you were running for post-commissioner spot, 
you were dating and courting a company to bring them here while you were running. Yes. And you were signing contracts and you took an oath of office in December of 12 and started January 1 of 13 and sat right here beside me. And I was told nothing until the announcement was made October 3rd, 2013. I wasn't the only commissioner that didn't know what was going on when they signed the contracts because the post one commissioner at the time was Larry Ragdale and he didn't know. I didn't know. And supposedly at that time, David Barnett didn't know. Only two knew was David Austin and Tommy Grant. That's not, that's not okay for you to continue to say that. There have been papers waived, I believe, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth of October, 2013 in the meeting. This is a meeting where the room was filled up. People came in, were very, very upset about what had happened, that their general aviation airport was gonna go commercial. The contracts were signed a year before that. And to be honest, they never voted on the correct contracts. Some people think it's not a big deal, it is. What was on your agenda, see, we learned from history, was the Silver Common Agreement, not the Terminal Lease and Use Agreement for the airport. Airport use and terminal, it was not. Any kind of, anything that we've discussed up here with the reservoir, we attach it to the reservoir. We don't, we don't attach something else to it, vote on it. You voted on a silver common agreement. It's on video. But on October 8th in that meeting, that heated meeting where people were frustrated, 2013, papers were waived up here by that chairman. They talked about do the open records, y'all. You'll find out that Todd Pownell knew. Do the open records, y'all. Couldn't show them to us that day. You know why? Because they were blank papers. Mm -hmm. Blank papers. Citizens, attorneys, all kind of people did the open records. And they got nothing back. Same thing you're going to get back from Propeller and Brett Smith. Nothing. Later, there were sworn half a day that signed, and you signed one too. Y'all have later said, in sworn affidavits, you said to one another, David Austin signed one. The proof's out there. Yeah, I didn't know. Quit telling that, Dave. That's incorrect. You yourself, and again, I didn't get it on tape or video, and I learned two weeks ago that I should have. You yourself have apologized to me in person for not telling me. You have. I have prayed for a lot of years for the truth to come out. I have prayed for the last 90 days for the truth to come out. And I can promise you folks, there's going to be a day, Dave, that it does. Don't mislead the public. Don't say again that I should have known because I should have done open records. Y'all have tried to say I, I knew, you've tried to say I didn't know, you signed affidavits. We're way past that. I, I don't appreciate you saying that. 
don't do it no more. We're so far past it, we shouldn't have even uh, wasted the, the public's and um, <coughs> the audience uh, on this long conversation. Uh, uh, is there a motion on the floor that we drop all lawsuits against all other county components? We're not in the voting time. And to that, there's people in the audience that I believe have drank from a polluted well. They believe certain things that are true. I think this is a healthy discussion, not only for those folks, but everybody here. It's on video for them to see. There's nobody hiding a thing in the world today. And I've asked several times with no answers, but uh, I believe a no answer. Can we talk about the IGA intergovernment agreement this time? It's far off at this airport. Yes. Sir? Fifteen oh one was a resolution that this board no longer supported the one thirty nine. But prior to us getting here, we had been elected in May. I believe it was in November the vote was brought about to tie our hands with the intergovernment agreement. To where this board no longer no longer had any authority over the airport, but financially we to support them. We pay their bills. This board has paid bills that we didn't know. I've heard it said before, it's like having a child leave home because they don't like your rules. I'm gonna live over here and I want you to send the money every month to pay my bills. That's a pretty good analogy on that. That's pretty good uh, if you look at it. It's, my wife came to one of the commissioners. I did, could not be here that day and be in the audience, but my wife knew a little about this. And she asked the commissioner to vote no to this. And she told me he chuckled at her. He said, no, he's gonna do what he wants to. Those that sat on this board that voted for this knew what they were doing. They were tying our hands. We would have no so say so over the airport authority. We got anything but a fair handshake walking in the door. But well, we've lived with that when people come up and ask us, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? They don't realize the truth is our hands were tied before we came into office. Mm -hmm. But yet we have honored every bill that's been sent our way. The taxpayers have paid it because we paid it. And they've not paid us back. And once again, this, this whole discussion is about integrity. If you have integrity, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't have integrity, you ain't got a clue what I'm talking about. But this board has integrity, I promise you that. This board has not went home and even sat down and eat potato chips and watch television. We work. I heard uh, one guy says it's a part-time job. It is a part-time job. It runs 24-7. I missed my granddaughter's wedding last week because I was taking care of county business. Every year, my wife uh, has a gathering with her company. I miss it every year because we have commissioner meeting. We have taken this job seriously. But to tie our hands before we get here and tell us, now go fight to fight now, your hands are tied. Yeah. is unfair. That's right. Since this is a work session to produce the voting meeting, I'd like to. So that's what you have to do. Uh, yeah, I was. I wanted to clarify for the clerk, since she needs to do the agenda, that on this evening's agenda there will be an action item, and that action will be to um, approve the dropping of the lawsuits to terminate the lawsuits against any other county entity, because that was the motion that was put forth. That's okay. correct. I just wanted to make sure, because Ms. Merrick needs that for the, the evening agenda. Is that what Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other discussion? That's the conclusion of the regular business. So there is executive session needed for personnel uh, and potential and pending litigation. There are no uh, people that uh, have signed up for non-agenda items. So at this uh, time, I'll entertain a motion that we uh, adjourn for executive session. I'll make the motion to go to executive session for reasons of personnel and potential and pending litigation. Motion by Commissioner Davis, is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Crow. All those in favor say aye. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. I'll call the regular session back to order, and um, we took no action in the executive session. So, unless there's any other business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. It's been adjourned by Commissioner Pownell. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Collette. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 or adjourned.